Now let's dive into this modulator section, which is really where things get interesting here. This is at the bottom of the interface, and you'll notice that you have to have the switch switched over to modulators. There's this, there's this toggle at the bottom, and you may, you may see this. That means that you're on macro controls. If you switch over to modulators, this is what you'll see. Now, as we described before, Scanner uses a variety of modulation sources to tell the playhead how to move through the sample. So it has two oscillators, an LFO, an envelope, and a feedback generator. The oscillators, importantly, do not produce sound on their own. What they do is send their waveform to modulate the playhead position. So that's just worth repeating because instinctively you'd think that you'd hear the waveform. You're not actually hearing the waveform in the case of the oscillators. You're hearing how that waveform interacts with the playhead. When we move down to modulators, what we see is that we have detailed parameters for each one of the modulation sources. So we have our uh, two oscillators here at right, or at left, excuse me, and we have our envelope, our LFO, and our feedback. Now looking at the first oscillator, oscillator A, we see that we have this knob, and in fact both of these are identical. We have this knob that allows us to tell the oscillator what kind of waveform to use in modulating the playhead position. So right now uh, with this chamber low snapshot, and I'm going to reset this, it's, this is snapshot uh, 8 in, in bank 3 by the way, we're set to kind of this intermediate position. What we have here are a sine wave all the way to the left, a triangle wave at the 12 o'clock position, and a ramp up wave at the right. And so we can change the waveform just by moving through this dial here in more of a triangle. Now you're hearing something that's kind of between a triangle and a ramp up sound. Kind of a, kind of a more cutting sound. And as I get all the way to the edge there, it really starts to break apart. So this gives you a, a variety of possibilities. Now we didn't have access to this in the A panel view. We just had access to the amount of modulation of the playhead being done by each of these modulators. So this really gives us a, a broad spectrum of sounds within e of sound within each one of the oscillators. And it gets, more, it gets better because next to this, we have our oscillator modulation source selectors, or not selectors, but uh, amounts. So next to this, we have uh, faders for LFO, envelope, and feedback. And what these are going to do is allow this oscillator to start taking instructions from the various parameters on how to modulate the playhead position. Right? So the oscillator has a waveform, but you can also modulate that waveform by recourse to these distinct uh, or these different parameters. So let's take the LFO for example. If I crank this up and I, I tell the oscillator to accept the maximum amount of positive modulation from the LFO, here's what I hear. Kind of that weird wobbly siren type sound, right? Because it's looking to the LFO and it's taking this waveform, which in the case of the LFO is somewhere between a sine wave and a triangle wave, and then it's also looking to the rate to modulate uh, the oscillator's waveform. If I crank up this rate, or if I alter the waveform and move to a pulse wave or a square wave, we have more of kind of an on off sound. Well, that's really kind of a rising sound, but for some of the other snapshots, it'll be more of an on-off sound. We'll dig into this more uh, more deeply in a second, but back to this. We can crank this down and go back to our uh, our original position here in the middle. Yeah, this this lights up when you're at the, at the uh, zero position. Now, next to that is an envelope modulation dial. So if I crank up the envelope, what I'm telling it, this oscillator is to look at the envelope to tell it how to, to how to shape its sound. And that's what it sounds like, right? So if I raise the attack on this and you see that the, that registers in this uh, display, it will, it will move in accordance with that. And once again, we'll get back to the envelope later. Next to that is the feedback modulation dial. And feedback, as I said before, tends to be pretty out there. You want to be careful on how you use this, but it can produce some really cool sounds. So if I dial in a little bit of that, and a, a little goes a long way with feedback, so bear that in mind. 
you get kind of these unpredictable, kind of, kind of harsh, raw sounds. You can see that in the oscilloscope. It's really registering the texture of that sound. Now next to that we have pitch bend. And pitch bend is probably familiar to you from uh, other synths. This allows us to establish a range in which we're going to use our pitch bend on our keyboard or uh, as automated in a, in a DAW to alter the pitch. Like so. Now I'm using a MIDI keyboard. There's no reason you can't automate this, as I said, in a DAW. And you can go negative as well, right? So you can invert your pitch bend controls. Useful for bass sounds especially. Next to that we have a transposition. So this is a, a an oscillator transposition in semitones. We're set to 48 now. You can move up and down. And once again that moves in semitones and you can get some fine control over here on the right field. That more of a detuning effect there. Now underneath here is a parameter that is that is key tracking and this tells scanner how much to connect where you're playing on the keyboard to the frequency of the oscillator. So now at one, it's tracking my key, my uh, keys. At zero, any key I play on the keyboard is going to register the same frequency because it's not looking to the key, the 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 key being played to tell it how to tune itself. And then if I crank it up, I'm producing some kind of stretch tuning. It's going to go beyond even the one-to-one -one key tracking and kind of stretch things out a little bit, so bear that in mind. Now next to this we have our envelope for our oscillator. This is interesting because you'll notice that it has more sliders or faders than you're used to seeing. This is an ADBDSR envelope. I know that's a mouthful and this kind of baffled me the first time I saw it in the documentation. What this gives you is an attack, a decay, a breakpoint, a second decay, a sustain and a release. So there are really two extra stages here. We're used to seeing the attack, decay, sustain, release envelopes. So this, this just gives you an additional two levels of control. You'll see that if I adjust this breakpoint, you're adjusting between kind of two de uh, decay stages. I might have said delay earlier. If I, if I did, I meant decay. Uh, so this is an additional level of control. Now this... This directly controls the oscillator. And as I said, gives you a really surprising amount of control over the sound because of these two extra stages. Now here to the right, you see that this is graphically displayed. Helpful for visualizing your sound. Now next to this, we have velocity and key tracking just for the envelope. So if we want our velocity to really affect the peak and sustain levels, of the envelope, we can crank this to the max. So the softer I play, or the harder I play, it it impacts the functioning of the envelope. If I crank this to nothing, I still hear the velocity in terms of the intensity of the sound, but the velocity is not impacting how the envelope works. And the same goes for key scaling. This is a key scale parameter that allows you to uh, to kind of soften the effect of the envelope for the higher registers, to kind of mellow it out a little bit. And this is probably better heard on, on one of the higher register sounds, like, I don't know, wooden object. Don't ask me what happened at the beginning of that, I have no idea. It's kind of a cool sound though. So if I crank this up, uh, the key scaling, hear that it does more to control, to bring down the peak and sustain levels at the higher ranges. If I bring that down, it's not going to make any accommodation for where I'm playing in the piano roll. Now we're familiar with the envelope settings or the envelope parameters because we've covered them in the oscillator, but just to refresh, we have attack, decay one, breakpoint, decay two, sustain and release. So this is kind of a, a traditional ADSR envelope with, with two more stages. Now, this controls the envelope modulator up here. 
Now I've selected the twin retro snapshot to illustrate this. But with this and with all the others, you have to have some amount dialed in in the synth engine or in the A panel view in order for any changes down here to take effect. In this snapshot, we have this very long attack stage. So when I play a note, You'll hear that what it's doing is moving very slowly from left to right based on this attack setting because the attack is raised very high. Now if I start to bring this down you'll see that because I'm asking it to, to make the attack faster it's going to zip over there at a much higher rate even if I pull it down just a very slight amount. And once I bring it down further than that it becomes almost inaudible because it's moving so quickly over the sample at the attack stage and now it's dropping back at the release stage you see that's how it's moving back over the sample this green line now all of these are adjustable and you can also dial in negative modulation in this case it's going to move off to the left where there is no sample information so we're going to take it and move the course position slider over so we have more to work with here and then you'll see that it actually moves in reverse and if we raise the attack up, it's going to move at a snail's pace across there and give us some really interesting textures. And then of course the same goes for all of the rest of these. If we drag these down, we're going to have a very different behavior. It just zips back there. It's kind of a pulsing sound. All of this stuff matters, but it's also a function, again, as I said, of how much of the modulation, positive or negative, you have dialed in. And in the case of the envelope, how much of the sample you're covering, right? We have this millisecond section over here in which you're covering a very small range, and then the, the percent covers the full range of the sample. So keep that in mind. And we've noticed that our graphical display has changed to reflect the alterations that we've made to the attack, uh, decays, and so forth parameters. Velocity sensitivity off to the right of the, of the display determines how much of the velocity that the velocity of your playing is going to impact the peak and sustain levels of the envelope. So if you, if you crank this up, The harder you play, the more the envelope is going to accommodate how hard you're playing and kind of alter the peak and sustain levels to work with that, kind of smooth things out. If you bring this down to zero, the envelope is going to work the same way no matter how hard you play. So it's a subtle effect. It differs from snapshot to snapshot, but it's worth being familiar with. And next to this, we have key tracking, which scales the attack decay and release times. So what this does is it kind of makes a time adjustment for notes that are played higher in the piano roll, right? So it kind of shortens the higher notes. It's essentially contracting the time that it takes for this envelope to execute uh, over the sound based upon where you're playing in the, in the piano roll. Again, a subtle effect, but worth being familiar with.